Well, uh, thank you. Good evening uh, to all of you, and uh, thank you, Don, for that uh, very, very warm uh, introduction. It's certainly uh, it's great to, to be back here at the uh, Ford Presidential Museum uh, once again uh, tonight, and I want to thank uh, the Ford Foundation for uh, hosting this evening. The Ford uh, Foundation has uh, done a remarkable job of telling uh, the story of Gerald Ford's life through this museum and uh, all of these uh, wonderful exhibits, newly refreshed and, and beautiful exhibits as a result uh, of the renovation that has gone through here. Uh, I've had uh, the opportunity to tour this museum on, on several occasions and I'm always struck by some of the uh, very unique items uh, that are here that uh, have certainly left an impression with me, uh, such as the staircase uh, from the American Embassy uh, in Saigon. I saw that again today as we went through the exhibit. And the, and the desk from uh, Congressman Ford's uh, office uh, here uh, from the House of Representatives. And, and some of you might, might already know this, uh, but I'm, uh, I, I feel particularly honored in the fact that the office uh, that I occupy in the federal building uh, here in Grand Rapids is the office that Gerald Ford had when he was uh, in the House of Representatives. And now I'm blessed to, to have that for my U.S. Senate office uh, here in Grand Rapids. Uh, it's no secret that Michigan is proud to be the home of our nation's uh, 38th uh, president and Ford's uh, Michigan roots uh, and experiences as an Eagle Scout, uh, as an officer in the United States Navy, built his reputation as a man of the highest uh, integrity. It was his character that uh, helped heal uh, our nation, whose trust uh, had been shattered following Watergate and President Nixon's uh, resignation. And while many Americans uh, recognize that as uh, President Ford's legacy, he also left, as we heard, a, a lasting impact on our nation's space program as well, which today continues to inspire Americans of, uh, of all ages uh, to dream about uh, the impossible. Much of who we are and what we have achieved uh, in the past decades as a country, and, and really for that matter, uh, as a civilization, stems from our efforts as a country to explore space. Through Gerald, though Gerald Ford served only a little over two years as the President of the United States, he presided over some, some really historic milestones in the space program that has paved the way for our nation's future in space and will continue to go forward as we'll talk about later. Uh, that is why I think it's fitting that the Ford Museum is opening the space, a journey to our future, a new interactive exhibit that will give visitors the opportunity to experience the, the history of space exploration and imagine the discoveries that lie ahead of us. This exhibit not only highlights the major contributions like, uh, like President Ford have made to space exploration, but also the power to inspire future generations of explorers, scientists, astronauts, and engineers who will take it even further. Uh, many of you remember the very real fear of nuclear annihilation that existed uh, during the Cold War with the Soviet Union. And on July 15, 1975, as was mentioned, in the, in the midst of that uh, Cold War, a man Soviet or a Russian Soviet Soyuz capsule launched from the desert of Kazakhstan. A few hours later, an Apollo spacecraft launched from Cape Canaveral, Florida. Two days later, the Russian and the American vehicles docked together in Earth orbit exchanging passengers and working cooperatively to conduct experiments uh, on this joint spacecraft. The telephone that uh, President Ford used to place a very long distance call at that time uh, to those astronauts, uh, along with the memo from his staff uh, prepared for the call, are displayed obviously here in the museum. I had a chance to see them again today. And it really represent a, a seminal moment uh, in our nation's uh, space journey. President Ford was part of a, a very visible uh, moment, but behind the scenes, it took an enormous amount of very challenging collaborative work between NASA and the Russians uh, to make that mission a success. Human spaceflight was still in its infancy, and the mechanics of an in-space rendezvous and docking was actually very new and very dangerous, and had only been worked out a few years before because of the moon landings. While this important moment singled a, a thawing between these two Cold War nations, it also launched a, a new era of space exploration. The first period of space exploration, as we recall, was really all about winning. It was about countries trying to check off new advances and accomplishments like beating each other into orbit, 
who was going to be the first to complete a spacewalk, and who was going to plant the first flag on the moon. The next era, however, really started with that Soyuz Apollo mission. The mission was about international cooperation to advance human knowledge, and it laid the foundation for sustained, peaceful habitation beyond our home planet of Earth. That turning point, symbolized by the telephone that's right here in the Ford Museum, is a clear example of how powerful a force for peace and prosperity the exploration of space can be. Think about this for a moment. The Apollo and, and Soyuz space vehicles were developed by the United States and the Soviets as really proxies for the military conflict that had the potential to destroy the Earth as we know it. Yet those very spa same space vehicles who were proxies for a war actually became major instruments of diplomacy. And they brought the two superpowers together in a peaceful collaboration. Cooperation between the United States and Russia continued through the Shuttle Mir program that led to one of the greatest engineering achievements uh, in human history, the International Space Station. For over 15 years now, astronauts from the United States, Russia, Japan, Canada, and the UK have lived and worked continuously aboard the International Space Station to advance our understanding of space, Earth, the cosmos, and, and even the human body. Now we are turning our sights to human exploration of Mars. Mars is on the very horizon of our capabilities as a civilization. And it's, it's just beyond, it lies just beyond our current technological limits to get there. Located hundreds of times further away than our moon, and hundreds of thousands of times away from the International Space Station, the only way this mission will be possible in the future is going to be through the joint power and collaboration of the world's spacefaring nations. And though Mars represents the next frontier of space exploration, our work to understand Earth planetary neighbor stretches back to President Ford's time in the White House. On July 20th, 1976, President Ford watched as the United States, as we heard, landed Viking 1 on Mars, the first fully successful mission to the red planet's surface. The feat was repeated only a month later by Viking 2. Once the experiments aboard the Viking lander, or one of them, was the instrument to test the Martian soil for signs of life. The results of the test uh, turned out to be very controversial and uh, perhaps are probably best characterized uh, as inconclusive at that time. But in the time since, evidence is, is certainly mounting uh, that life uh, very well may exist uh, beyond our planet. In the past decade, we have found so many planets orbiting other stars that scientists now think there may be around 100 billion planets just in our Milky Way galaxy alone. And they believe that there are probably well over 100 billion galaxies in total in the universe. In a couple of years, we're going to be launching the James Webb Space Telescope, which will help us study some of these alien planets and perhaps learn more about ones which may be able to support life. This telescope will have instruments that capture images in the infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum to peer back in time as well. Currently, the Hubble telescope can peer back about 500 million years into the history of our universe. Uh, the new Charles Webb telescope will likely be able to take us back even further in what we think is a 13 billion year history since the, the Big Bang. It may actually be able to peer back to about 500 million years right after the bang, so billions of years back into time. In fact, this instrument that will be launched in a couple of years, and I've had the pleasure of seeing it uh, in the works as it's being built from Earth, is, is so sensitive. It's in the infrared sector, so it measures heat. And actually, in the exhibit that you're going to see upstairs, there's, you can see the heat of your own body as the camera picks it up, and you'll see your head's real red. The rest, not so much. Heat sensitive, and that's what the web will be detecting. But think of how the, the instruments are so sensitive. And I do this uh, little experiment when you go outside. It's a clear night. I think you can see the moon out there. So Charles Webb can measure the heat, or actually detect the heat and detect, a, detect an object. If it's on Earth and looking at the moon, it can detect, de detect, excuse me, de detect the heat of a single bumblebee. 
That's pretty mad. So imagine looking at the moon tonight and have an instrument that can find one bumblebee on the moon because of the heat signature. That's what we'll be sending into space in order to look back and to be looking for other life as well. However, there may be alien life a lot closer than where the Webb telescope will take us. Decades after the Viking experiments, uh, NASA's Curiosity rover has discovered that Mars uh, very likely once had the kind of warm and wet environment that basic forms of life as we know it could actually have evolved. Right now, the planet is very desolate and it's barren. We do know there's water, water up in the polar ice caps that are frozen. There are other evidence of water in the ground as well that has been determined. And based on the recent uh, expedition and looking at rock formations and some of the geology of Mars, it has been estimated by scientists that uh, there definitely was uh, large amounts of water on Mars. And those large amounts of water could have been on that planet for about one billion years. So having water on a planet in very large amounts for a billion years is certainly enough time for life to evolve, at least in, in some sort of form uh, during that time. So we believe that there may, today, possible, there's still small microscopic organisms that are living there. A little further away, though, the story gets in some ways even more interesting. Jupiter has a moon called Europa that scientists think harbors a vast salt water ocean beneath a, a very thin crust of ice around there. This ocean is likely larger than all of the oceans on Earth combined. And who knows what kind of exotic life uh, forms may inhabit that alien ocean, which has been warmed, although it's covered with ice, is warmed by the core of the moon, which heats it up and is warm. Much of what we know about Europa, however, is just from a couple of robotic probes that have briefly flown by it. But in a few years, NASA will be going to launch a mission that will be devoted to studying that moon in detail. And perhaps a mission will find alien life as it actually drills through that ice core and takes a look at the water that exists uh, underneath. And you can just imagine, as we have this mission in Mars and what's happening in Europa, the, the transformational power of a discovery of life beyond Earth and what that could mean to our civilization. Imagine uh, we discover that on all of these places where life, on the other hand, all these places where life could exist, maybe it doesn't exist. We're looking at all these places, but we don't find it. So imagine we discover that life is actually an incredibly extraordinary rare phenomena, even all we have billions of planets, and our emergence on Earth was unique to the whole of the cosmos. Either finding, finding life or finding that we are alone uh, will and will uh, either answer to the question first asked by the Viking explorers that uh, President Ford was involved in will be incredibly profound. Back in the 1970s when we sent uh, astronauts to the moon, uh, they, they were there for only a few days uh, before they had to come back. Uh, but even then, Michiganders uh, were playing a very important role in our space program. The University of Michigan, which is uh, proud to call Gerald Ford uh, a graduate, also trained the, the three astronaut crew of Apollo 15 mission. The all Michigan crew, in fact we saw uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, crew uh, flew the first uh, rover, land the rover on the moon was the part of Apollo 15. I think the wheel is in the exhibit that we're gonna see up there. Uh, know that the three astronauts that were on that mission were all University of Michigan uh, graduates. And they even established the, the lunar chapter of the University of Michigan Alumni Association there. It's a pretty, uh, pretty select group to be part of that alumni association there on the moon. Uh, but since those early uh, missions uh, to the moon, we've been working to discover how humans can live longer and longer in space. Recently, an American astronaut named uh, Scott Kelly uh, and a Russian cosmonaut spent an entire year on the space station. The next step is to send astronauts back into deep space uh, near the moon and we'll see if they can live a couple of years at a time in space, which is an incredibly hostile environment for the human body. Then we'll be ready for the journey to Mars, which could take a, a fairly long time. The trip to Mars under the current conditions and current technology we have and what we're developing with the SLS, it's about a six month journey uh, to Mars. And I'll say the, uh, the Orion spacecraft that will be on top is about the size of a large SUV. So uh, four astronauts in the, that space plus the additional There'll be some additional compartments we can talk about later in the Q&A, which will make it a little roomier. But that's a long time, six months. And then when they get to Mars, uh, you can either stay there a short period of time, and this is when Mars is the closest to Earth, 
You can stay there a short period of time, a week or two, then get back, and it would take a little over six months back. But the decision made, if we're going to be investing the kind of money that we're going to be investing and the amount of effort and to, to send folks to Mars, they probably should stay longer than two, two weeks. Uh, but they need, if they stay there longer, they've got to wait till the planet comes back around. Otherwise, it's an incredibly long trip to come back. Right now, we estimate that they'll have to stay on the planet a little over 400 days. So a little over a year on the planet before taking, a, again, a six-plus month trip back. So a very long journey uh, for those astronauts. Today, NASA and industry partners, including a number of companies right here in Michigan, are actually building the space launch system, or the SLS, uh, the rocket that will launch that mission. It is taller than the Statue of Liberty, and this heavy lift launch vehicle will have four times more thrust at liftoff than the, any of the biggest rockets uh, that we have today. Manufacturers in Michigan are also producing materials for the uh, Orion spacecraft that will be on top of that SLS rocket that will carry the astronauts. First uh, mission, we hope, uh, with astronauts uh, up for, uh, around the moon will be around 2021, 20, 22. Uh, we're hoping to have the first launch of the SLS, which will not have a human crew, around 2018, about a, a year and a half or so from now. Uh, eventually, though, that uh, system will go on to Mars. Meanwhile, companies including SpaceX, uh, Boeing, and the United Launch Alliance will begin ferrying astronauts, uh, these are private companies, commercial companies, will be ferrying astronauts to the International Space Station and will hopefully start to build a thriving commercial space industry uh, in Earth orbit while NASA pushes further out uh, into the solar system. I'm very excited to get these commercial flights going and to get them uh, up to the space station. Right now, we don't have lift capacity to get American astronauts uh, to the space station uh, since we discontinued the shuttle program. And so we actually uh, have to pay for a ride on Russian rockets, uh, which I think is outrageous. Uh, we have to spend about $70 million uh, for a seat uh, to get an astronaut to the space station. Uh, this is America. We're going to do our own. We're going to have our own rockets, and we can't have them soon enough, uh, in my mind. The journey to Mars uh, will be long, uh, and there's much that we have to do to prepare for it. From new methods of propulsion into deep space habitats to life support systems, NASA, along with industry, academia, and international partners, uh, they're working every day as we speak on, on, on solving these uh, very difficult challenges. To ensure NASA is equipped to further their mission, I, along with Senator Ted Cruz of Texas, Senator Bill Nelson of Florida, and other colleagues of mine on the committee, recently introduced NASA's Transition Act of 2016. This is a bipartisan piece of legislation, and it'll give NASA the stability needed to keep the agency's important exploration and science missions uh, going forward over the next few years. It also reaffirms congressional support for many of the themes that, that I've been discussing. The search for life beyond Earth, expansion of humanity into deep space, increasing commercial opportunities in Earth orbit, growing our knowledge of the cosmos, and continuing international collaboration. This bill represents a consensus, nice to hear that from Congress, isn't it? A consensus of members of Congress from across the ideological spectrum. Boy, I love saying that, isn't that great? Uh, that once again, and I think that once again demonstrates, once again, the power of our space program to bring people together. To look uh, past our differences uh, and uh, in one of the most contentious times, and I'm proud to say that in July, the Commerce Committee voted, hear this, we voted unanimously to move that bill out of uh, the full Senate. It is my hope that the bill will pass uh, both chambers before the end of the year. Keeping NASA's mission on track is, uh, is not just important to the agency and to scientists. I think it's something that is particularly important to thousands of small and medium-sized businesses across the country where dedicated men and women are working to move our space program forward. Companies uh, here in Michigan, like Futuromic Tool in Engineering in Macomb and Plascore in Zealand, are very proud parts uh, of the building process uh, for the Mars mission. As a senator from Michigan, uh, I understand this is, and we all know, this is the epicenter uh, for the automotive world. And actually, if you look at the automotive world, I see there's very striking similarities between human space exploration and the automotive industry. Following a very long period of growth and prosperity through the 1990s and early 2000s, the automotive industry was shaken to its core by the Great Recession, which closed factory doors and cost thousands of American jobs. But the auto industry responded after that crisis by doing what America does best. They endured, 
They innovated and they rose to the challenge. And with record sales in recent years, the U.S. automotive industry has emerged as truly a great American comeback story. We've seen similar highs and lows in the space industry. We landed men on the moon and then canceled the Apollo project. We had an amazing success with the iconic space shuttle, but we also, of course, endured the Challenger and Columbia tragedies. We've constructed a football-sized space station and maintained continuous human habitation for over 15 years. But following the retirement of the space shuttle, we faced challenges and false starts in fielding successor space programs. However, now, just like the, the American auto industry, human spaceflight is making a comeback in, an, in a very big way. NASA and America's private sector are working together with a common goal, building more efficient, safer, and more capable systems. But we must continue to innovate, find new efficiencies, meet our deadlines, and meet the highest standards of excellence. These are the same elements that help bring the automotive industry back to where it is today. And I believe that these elements will continue to bring U.S. human space exploration to a new high. While space undoubtedly inspires us, it also has real impact on the economy and rapidly evolving technology as well. In fact, as much as half of the economic growth in the United States over the last 50 years is attributable to advances simply in science and technology. These advancements help launch new industries, form new global companies, establish the United States as the international leader in innovation. Today, American ingenuity is leading the way in emerging fields like artificial intelligence, autonomous vehicles that have the potential to save tens of thousands of lives, and gene editing technologies that could revolutionize healthcare as we know it. None of these advances would be possible without a national commitment to scientific research and education. Government investment in basic research, including investments in space exploration, is critical absolutely critical to ensuring that the United States stays at the forefront of technology. In fact, I personally believe that we need to substantially increase U.S. investment in science and research across the board to at least 1% of GDP, which is closer to what we were investing in during the space race in the 1960s, and certainly President Ford's uh, time as well. Federal investments in our space program have paid off dozens and dozens of times over the past several decades. Look at our whole innovation ecosystem. It's basically the, the dynamo that drives us. Innovation comes from the drive to tackle impossible problems, the creativity to develop elegant solutions, the inspiration born in the minds of dreamers, the knowledge that comes from research and experimentation, and the empowerment of a free and open society. These are the same ingredients that power our space program. And the miracle of the innovation is that if properly cultivated, it will generate new ideas and even greater innovation. That has certainly rung true in our space program, which has led to discoveries as wide-ranging as medical imaging technology. To the tiny camera in your cell phone, thank the space program for that tiny camera, which I'm sure you've used a few times. The space program, from the Gemini missions uh, to the Apollo missions to the space shuttle, have inspired countless engineers and technicians who've worked to revolutionize digital electronics, the personal computer, the internet, and the mobile communication tools that we couldn't even imagine life without now. The same is true for entrepreneurs of today, like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, who are building massive technological enterprises to further our efforts in space. But space exploration yields so much more than the latest technology to make life better on Earth or new knowledge about our universe. Space exploration also brings us hope. It brings us wonder, and it helps bring us closer together. Just as our generation or my generation watched uh, Apollo missions unfold on television and had our eyes open to new worlds of possibilities by watching that, I hope today's young people Today, we'll get the same sense of wonder from our mission to Mars. As the ranking member of the Space Science and Competitive Subcommittee, I've had the opportunity to see firsthand how space exploration inspires uh, today's students. Last year, I, I visited a middle school in Macomb County with astronaut Charlie Precoat. Uh, and I can tell you, as I went into that classroom, uh, no one was real interested in the senator that was standing there. Uh, they only wanted to hear about space, and they only wanted to hear about uh, astronaut Precoat's uh, four missions uh, into outer space. 
Uh, earlier today, I had the privilege of speaking to a group of middle school students about America's future in space. Uh, these young people are, are truly uh, the Mars generation, and I was impressed by their questions and their enthusiasm about the program as well. They are, will be the, the first generation. The young folks today, we've got some here today, will be the first generation that will become interplanetary. But that goal requires us to make some critical investments today, not just in rockets, but in education. We know that to maintain our economic competitive edge, we must dramatically grow our investments in science, technology, engineering, and math, known as STEM education. Whether these students want to travel into space or design the next generation automobile, educating our children and investing in science is the key to American success. I am privileged in my job as a U.S. Senator to meet some of the top minds in our nation, and I'm enthusiastic about space and science because these folks have shown just how much we can accomplish if we are diligent in our exploration. Historically, Michigan has played a key role in the U.S. space program, as I mentioned. The University of Michigan, in fact, taught the nation's first course in aeronautical engineering all the way back to 1914. From Ed White, a Michigan alum who completed the first ever spacewalk to the Apollo 15 crew that I mentioned, Michiganders have been a key part of the space program success. And I believe we owe a special debt of gratitude to President Ford, who, while in Congress, as we heard, sat on the advisory board that actually created NASA. He was part of the gener of this, uh, uh, start of this agency at its very beginning. And under NASA's stewardship, we have gone from being firmly planted on Earth to exploring the stars. And Michiganders will continue to play a role in future journeys to space. In fact, Dr. Thomas uh, Zuperkin is a Michigan professor, and he was just recently named NASA's Associate Administrator for Science uh, for that great institution. I uh, look forward to continuing to work uh, w w to ensure that Michigan continues to play a very pivotal role in America's space program, whether it be conducting scientific research at one of our world-class universities, training the next generation of engineers, scientists, and astronauts, or building precision manufacturing equipment that we are doing now in Michigan to carry astronauts further. Looking at all we have accomplished uh, during President Ford's time and seeing how far we've come in years since, it's clear that the possibilities for our future are limitless, and I look forward to the opportunity to talk more about these programs with you during the question and answer period. Thank you so much. Thank you.